So 1 Kings chapter 11, let's begin in verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, the Moabite, the Ammonite, the Edomite, the Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Verse 6, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place For Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Parents, just a little warning. I will remain PG. But we will, we will talk about some serious subjects. So, but I will keep it PG, all right? Because there are some issues here that we need to talk about. As we begin this passage this morning in chapter 11, the first thing we see in the first section as we look at an outline of the text is the record of Solomon's fall into sin. This is verses 1 through 8. And as we read these eight verses, I'm sure you would agree that this is a very tragic section in the Bible. In fact, I would say it's probably one of the most tragic sections in all of the Bible. The reason being because of Solomon's sin and how he loved so many women, and not just women, but foreign women. It's not a race issue, by the way. It's not as though the text is communicating to us that the Canaanite women, the other non-Jewish women that Solomon had married were an inferior race. That's not the issue. The issue is a spiritual one. It's a spiritual issue. The writer explicitly tells us the reason the Jews and the king were not supposed to marry foreign women was because they would draw their hearts away from the Lord to follow their false gods. It tells us that in Exodus 23, 32, also in Deuteronomy 7. That is why they were not to marry other peoples or foreign women. And what God said would happen, happened to Solomon. Exactly the way he said it. Did you notice the phrase that it says in verse 2, And Solomon held fast to these in love. Listen to this. This is Deuteronomy 11, verse 22. Moses wrote this, For if you are careful to keep all His commandment, which I am commanding you to do, listen to this, to love Yahweh your God, to walk in all His ways, listen to this, and to hold fast to Him. You see, the way in which Solomon was commanded and expected to love Yahweh the God of Israel, the Lord, he ended up loving his foreign wives that way. Loved them and was holding fast to them. Same words in that Deuteronomy text as we find here in 1 Kings 11. All 1,000 of them. Solomon loved many women. Now, even though he did not completely abandon the Lord, Right? Because that's what is communicated by that phrase. He wasn't wholly or completely devoted to the Lord. So it's not as though he completely forsook the God of Israel. His loyalties had become divided. And he went after other gods. Which means he worshipped those other gods. That's what that phrase means. Going after a false god means to worship those false gods. Their names were Ashtoreth, Milcom, Chemosh, 
and Molech, and they were detestable. We'll talk about why in a minute. So despite all of Solomon's wealth, his prosperity, the peace that he had, and all of his wisdom, Solomon gave in to the worship of false idols. Exactly how God said he would if he went after foreign wives. Listen to this description. This comes from the book of Isaiah. Listen to how Isaiah describes idolatry of the day. This was written later after Solomon, but it still speaks to what's going on. Listen to this. This is Isaiah 44. It says this, Surely he, speaking of a man, cuts cedars for himself. So he's chopping down wood. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. And he also makes a god and worships it. <clears throat> he makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire, and over half of it he eats his meat as he roasts a roast and is satisfied. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. That's ridiculous. That's Isaiah, that's Isaiah's point. This is what idolatry is. You take a log of wood, half of it you cut and you cook your food over it, and the other half you carve into an image and say that it's your God and you bow down and pray to it. It's ridiculous. Why would Solomon do this? Why would anyone do this? What really is at the heart of idolatry? What is the definition of it? What does it mean? Is it just the, the worship of physical idols that you make out of wood? Or is it something deeper? And if it is, are we here today in danger of that kind of idolatry? This is what the Bible says. This comes from 1 Samuel chapter 15. You may remember this. We looked at this when we were in 1 Samuel. This is the Lord after speaking to Saul, who had disobeyed him. This is what God had to say about Saul's disobedience. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed, another way of saying obey, than the fat of rams. Now get this, for rebellion is as the sin of divination. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Which is why he tells Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul, you're an idolater because you disobeyed me. You see, the issue of idolatry has to do with obedience and disobedience. Notice how the Lord says this is a heart issue. It doesn't matter if you come and give me sacrifices and gifts and outwardly you look like you obey me. What I'm really after is the heart. And Saul, your heart is far from me. Therefore, your disobedience against my word is idolatry. It's idolatry. To not obey God is as the sin of idolatry or witchcraft. That's what that word means, divination. And he's talking about obedience not because we have to, but because we want to from the heart. You see, idolatry is not just the worship of a physical idol. Indeed, it includes that. But the real issue is, is who are we loyal to? Who are we loyally obedient to? Who or what is most important to us? That's the issue of idolatry. And this is what is going on in Solomon's heart. Who and what had become more important to Solomon? It was his wives, it was their false gods, and it was Solomon's passions. Those had superseded his loyalty to the God of Israel and Solomon was guilty of idolatry. 
We can learn from this, by the way. We can learn from Solomon from a negative example on what idolatry is and how we can prevent it. And this is what I believe this passage has to teach us about idolatry, and we'll unpack this a little bit. The first thing I think it teaches us is that idolatry is anything or anyone that is more important to us than the Lord, than the God of Scripture, than the God of Israel. If anyone or anything, including ourselves, is more important to us than God, then that is idolatry. That's essentially what 1 Samuel 15 is saying in a nutshell. It's not just the worship of images or statues. It's the worship of things, of people, and of self. And it starts here in the innermost part of who we are that we usually refer to as the heart. If there is anyone or anything that we cannot live without, that's idolatry. If there is someone other than God, including ourselves, or something that defines who we are and what we live for, the Bible calls that idolatry. And it includes not just the wicked things, but it can be the good things as well. Put it this way, anything or anyone who sits on the throne of your heart has replaced God. That's his place, and that is idolatry. It could be your family. It could be your career. It could be your spouse. It could be your friends. It could be your possession. It could be your health. It could be what you eat. It could be what you enjoy. It could be pleasure. It could be excitement. On goes the list. If anything or anyone becomes more important to us than the Lord our God, God says that's idolatry. So, is this an issue for us? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. And then if this is true, which I believe it is, as I have demonstrated, then we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is this still an issue? What is, the, what is the enticement? What is the temptation to idolatry? What is the power that idolatry has? And it's simply this. Idolatry appeals to our emotions and sinful desires. Idolatry appeals to our emotions and sinful desires. Solomon was driven by his passions. He was dominated by his lust. And you know for what. Right? Those women were not his pen pals. <laughs> by the way, the worship of their gods was saturated in immoral behavior if you know what I mean. Ashtoreth was the fertility goddess. Okay? Do my best to keep this clean, parents. The Canaanites believed that Ashtoreth and her husband Baal, or we usually say Baal, would consort in the heavens, and the seed of Baal would fall down on the earth as rain, and therefore provide the crops for their food. Worshippers of Ashtoreth, Baal, and these false gods would reenact that scene in their temples with temple prostitutes and called it worship. The worship of Molech and Chemosh included the offering of your children as human sacrifices. You would put your child on a brazen altar where it would be consumed by fire and it was considered worship. Think about that. They'd kill their babies and called it worship. It made all that immoral behavior a little bit more manageable, didn't it? Who 
Who would do such a thing? You might be thinking, well, man, they weren't that smart back then. I mean, they bowed down to, to a piece of wood or a piece of gold, and they had these crazy images. I mean, that's, we would, no one would do that today. I mean, we've evolved. We're smarter. We're more intelligent. We're not susceptible to that kind of stuff. Why are we talking about that? Immoral behavior, and that's the nice way I'm saying it, is a massive moneymaker. Worldwide, the porn industry alone, that doesn't include all the other movies and advertisements and everything else that is driven by this issue, makes $97 billion a year. It's worth $97 billion. In the U.S. alone, 3,000 babies are killed every day. Babies are sacrificed every day. The God of immoral behavior is still with us, isn't he? This is just one example, and it's a powerful one. This is just one example on how idolatry appeals to our emotions and sinful desires. To obey feeling rather than God is idolatry. You hear that? To obey feeling rather than God or truth that God gives us is idolatry. Think of it this way. To fail to love your wife as Christ loves the church to sacrifice for her men because you don't feel like it is idolatry. In the same way, for wives, for them... To not submit to their husbands as Christ submits to the church and defines what that looks like because you don't feel like it. It's idolatry. Children, students, to fail to obey your parents as unto the Lord as the Bible commands of you because you don't feel like it is idolatry. To not love your neighbor as yourself because you don't feel like it is idolatry. You see where I'm going? Truth must always override what we feel. Always. Feelings are not bad. Emotions are not bad. God gave us those. But they're fickle. They're changing. And they can be deceptive. Truth is the standard. And they, I mean, can't you see how they deceived Solomon? The wisest, smartest man to ever walk the face of the earth saved the Lord Jesus alone. And yet he was lured by his emotions and sinful desires. One last thing about idolatry that Solomon teaches us here, I think, is this. Idolatry never, never satisfies the soul. Ever. Ever. When anything or anyone, including ourselves, becomes more important to us than the Lord, it will never, ever satisfy. It's like trying to drink salt water to quench your thirst. Your mouth may be wet for a while, but it always leaves you thirsty. Idolatry never satisfies the soul. I mean, we see this in the number of his wives. Now, as the king... Solomon gets the pick of the, of the litter. You know what I mean? The cream of the crop. Right? Solomon basically, all these women, maybe save a few who were royalty, and he just had to make an alliance. The vast majority of these women, I am convinced, were what I would call easy on the eyes. These would have been the supermodels of the day. Solomon gets all those. Why? Because he's the king. And he has a thousand of them because one just couldn't cut it. It didn't satisfy. They didn't satisfy. So he gathered more, thinking maybe if I have more, I'll be satisfied. But he didn't. 
More wasn't the answer. Mere outward beauty wasn't the answer. Fulfilling my insatiable desires is not the answer. Idolatry never satisfies. Now you might be saying, are you sure that's kind of what was going on, Carlos? I mean, actually, are you sure he was unsatisfied? Well, don't trust me. Look what he says. This is Solomon writing later on in his life after what we're looking at. This is what he wrote in Ecclesiastes. Listen to this. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility, meaning worthless. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see that what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works, I built houses for myself, I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted them in all the kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who had preceded me in Jerusalem. In other words, Solomon had a lot of stuff. Look at verse 8. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men. Here it is. Many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. Solomon indulged in everything. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Look at verse 11. Thus I considered all my activities, all this I had, all that I enjoyed, which, made, which my hands had done, and the labor which I had exerted. And behold, all was vanity. Striving after wind, there was no profit under the sun. You know what he's saying? I had it all. I enjoyed it all. I indulged in it all. There was nothing that my eyes would see that I could not have. I, I had it. And at the end of all of that, here's my conclusion. It's worthless. It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't fulfill. It doesn't bring peace that my soul seeks. That eternity that God has placed in my heart that he talks about later in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, none of this stuff could fill that. The reason idolatry does not satisfy the soul is because we were not created to be satisfied with stuff others even self we have been designed by God our creator to be satisfied in him and in him alone God alone the worship of God alone our relationship with God alone brings contentment brings peace brings satisfaction brings true joy because that's the way God made us Idolatry doesn't satisfy. And yet I, I wonder how, of us, how much of us will, would be tempted to think, but yeah, wouldn't that be kind of nice though? Just to have whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, as much as you wanted. Let's be honest. Let us be warned. Let's take Solomon's word for it. It doesn't satisfy. But because the Lord loves Solomon, and because he loves his people, he doesn't let him get away with it. Look at verse 9. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Think about that. The Lord appeared to this man twice. And the Lord was angry because of his sin. Verse 10. And had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, 
and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. The Lord said, I told you not to do this. I commanded you not to do this. I told you what would happen if you did this. You went and did it, and guess what? I'm going to take it away. Judgment is coming. God does not remain idle when his king and his people sin. The Lord remains true to his word, and he says, I am going to send the curses of the covenant that I promised I would send. I will send enemies against you. I will tear the kingdom from you, just like I said I would. However, did you also notice the measure of grace in the Lord's pronouncement of judgment? He says, but I won't completely destroy you, which he deserved. He goes, I will leave you on the throne during your lifetime, and not because of you, but because of David, my servant, whom I promised that what I would do. And I won't even take all the tribes away from you. I'll leave you with one. That's grace, folks. Didn't deserve that. So look what he does. The Lord fulfills his promise. He's, verse 14, then the Lord raised up adversaries, raised up an adversary to Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite, who was of the royal line of Edom. For it came about when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain and had struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel stayed there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled to Egypt. He and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him while Hadad was a young boy. They arose from Midian, and came to Paran, and they took men with them from Paran, and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house and assigned him food and gave him land. And there in Egypt, Hadad grows, and he prospers under the hand of Pharaoh, and as he gets older, and as he is more capable, he becomes an enemy of Solomon all of his days. The Lord raises up another enemy. Look at verse 23. Rezin, the son of Eliada, who had fled from his lord, had a desert king of Zobah. He gathered men to himself and became a leader of a marauding band. After David slew them at Zobah, and they went to Damascus, and there he stayed and reigned at Damascus. So you know what's going on here? Edom is to the south, east of Israel around. Damascus, the nation of Aram or Syria is to the north. The Lord is causing enemies to encroach upon Solomon from the north and the south. And he also does it from within. Look at verse 25. Then Jeroboam, son of Nebat, the Ephraimite of Zerida, Solomon's servant, just like God said it would be one of his servants, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this was the reason why he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the Milo, closed up the breach of the city of David, or the city of his father David, now the man Jeroboam was a valiant warrior, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he appointed him over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. And it came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak which was on him, and he tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. He goes on to say, But I'll leave him with one tribe. And the reason I'm going to do this is because of the idolatry that Solomon committed against me. How he went after these false gods of the Canaanites. How he indulged himself in the worship of these gods. How he did not keep from himself every desire of his eyes and sin against me. This is why I'm going to do it. In fact, next week we're going to see what happens with that when we look at chapter 12. The reason God does this like he said he would do this, is to bring Solomon and the nation to its knees to repentance. That's the whole purpose. He's not doing it to punish his people. He's doing it to correct his people. 
to humble them and draw them back to himself. And then at the end of the chapter, we read like everyone else who lived before him, whether they're great or whether they're small, Solomon died. Look what it says. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, this is verse 41, and whatever he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? Thus the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David and his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. And that's where we'll pick it up next week. Solomon dies for all his wisdom, for all his prosperity, for all his wealth. Like everyone else, he died. He died. Godliness is what was needed. Not wealth, not wisdom, not prosperity. Godliness. And Israel wouldn't get this king that they needed because every king who follows Solomon has issues. Maybe not as bad as Solomon's, but they all had flaws. It would be over 900 years later that the true son of David would come and claim the throne of his father David. So with our, our time left, I mean, what does this passage have to say about um, what does it have to say about the Lord? We learned about what it has to say about idolatry. Right? What is this the response to Solomon's sin? What does that teach us about God and how he interacts with us and why he interacts with us the way that he does? What does it teach us? It's the first thing. The Lord does not tolerate idolatry in his people. We talked about what that is. It isn't just the bowing down to little pieces of wood or gold or whatever you make from your hands. Idolatry is not tolerated in his people. Why? Because first, it offends him, and because he loves us. How would you feel if you had given Solomon all that wealth, all that peace, all that prosperity, all that stuff? How would you feel if he went and turned his back on you? God was highly offended by the idolatry of Solomon and the people. Highly offended. And because God is holy, he does not allow those offenses to go unanswered. It's not right to treat the Creator, the God of Israel, this way, and God is righteous, therefore He must respond. He doesn't tolerate it. He's holy. He's righteous. However, God also loves us. He loves Solomon. He loves His people. And therefore did not tolerate their idolatry. Because God knows what we said earlier, that idolatry never satisfies. It's not what we need. It's not what we've been designed for. And God knows that. God knows and understands that we, as His creatures made in His image, desire satisfaction, desire peace, desire contentment. God knows this because that's the way He made us. And He knows idolatry will not meet those desires. Listen to this. God loves His people. Do you believe that? If you are in Christ this morning, God overwhelmingly loves you. And because He loves you, because He loves us, he won't, he won't tolerate idolatry in our lives. He will address it. He will address it because He loves us. He knows it's destructive to us. What do we do as parents when our children are engaged in destructive behavior? What, what, are we, what, what are we compelled to do? We're compelled to act. When they're little, they're not allowed to run out into the street, right? They can't guzzle pixie sticks until 12.30 at night, right? It's not good for them.
because we love them. God loves you. God loves his people. And he will not allow idolatry to go unanswered. His love compels him to act and respond to the idolatry within his people. And when he acts, this is what we learn. The Lord will use difficult circumstances, and that's a general statement on purpose, to expose idolatry in our lives when necessary. Who decides when it's necessary? God decides when it's necessary. Don't think he won't do this, because he will, when he deems it necessary. These enemies that were sent against Solomon in order to bring Solomon to repentance were necessary. Solomon wasn't seeing it. He was blind to it. He had become sin deaf, right? So God sends enemies. Why? To remind him, Solomon, you know what I have written. You know what I have said. When I send enemies to you and don't protect you, the reason I do that is because I want you to repent. I want you to address your sin because I love you. I love my people. That's what was going on. God wasn't just saying, bad Solomon, you're punished, stay in your room. I don't want to hear you for another couple hours. Consequences with God and with parents, by the way, should always be and are, are, are always with God corrective. The Lord will use failure. The Lord will use broken relationships that we have broken the Lord will use suffering and every difficult circumstances that He deems necessary to bring us to repentance, to address idolatry in our lives. God will use pain. God will use difficulty. Why? Because He loves us. Because He cares for us. Because he knows that sin is destructive for us. It's fascinating to me when people want to ignore sin. And I'm talking about church leaders. Well, you don't want to offend them. You don't want to make them feel bad. Let me tell you something. If they had gangrene in their leg and it was festering and it was getting worse, would you ignore it just because you don't want to hurt their feelings? Sin is destructive. And it is a loving, albeit difficult thing, it is a loving thing to address sin and do something about it. God loves us. By the way, if we can get away with idolatry and there's no consequences, that's not a good thing. Because the Bible's very clear, not only in this passage, but all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, it's very clear that God says what? He chastens, He disciplines, He goes after those whom He loves in their sin. So if God isn't coming after us in our sin, and if we're getting away with it and there's no consequences and we just seem to prosper and what's the big deal? And it, that's not a good thing. That may indicate, I'm not the judge, God is, but that may indicate we're not His. That's not a good thing. The Lord disciplines those whom He loves. You know, tragically, these sins of Solomon affected him. We see that. We're going to see the kingdom is never the same after this golden age of Israel. Very tragic. So I think what we see is our failure to trust and obey God will always and eventually lead us to His judgment and its consequences. Always. Sometimes... That can mean eternal judgment, but for those who are his people, it's temporal judgment, meaning consequences. God doesn't mess around. Why? Because God loves us. That's why. He always brings consequences. 
Did we get any questions? We got three. Let's see what we can do about those. What is the difference between a wife and a concubine, and why didn't Solomon just make them wives? Is having concubines condemned at all? So, wives, concubines had a lot of the same privileges as a wife, okay? Usually they were named wives as if they were of royal birth, right? So, the family member of royalty, those were for a king anyway. Those were, would you consider those wives? But if they were of common birth, those were the ones that were usually concubines. Normally, concubines, the children of concubines wouldn't be heirs to the throne, but the, the children of the wives would. So there may be more to it. That's all I know as far as what's the difference. Are they condemned? Yes, they are. They are. So next one. Weren't there two tribes, not one, split away? Yeah, we'll see that. So he says, well, I'll save for you one tribe. And so the promise is, you get Judah. But what we'll see from now on is that Judah and Benjamin, the tribe of Saul, by the way, whom David had connections with, they always stayed with Judah. So it ends up being Judah and Benjamin, and then the other ten, as we'll look at next week, go to the north. Sometimes it refers to just the one, but as we'll see, Later, next week, Benjamin is included. So, How do we approach reading Solomon's writings? Do we treat Ecclesiastes as a book of what not to do and Proverbs as what to do? How do we discern? That's a very good question. I couldn't have asked for a better lead-in, by the way. I didn't put that up there. I don't know who, who sent that. Because it, it raises this issue. Did Solomon sin? even though it impacted the nation and his family for generations. Was it too late for Solomon to repent? No. It was not too late for Solomon to repent. In fact, I believe Ecclesiastes is a record of his repentance. At the end of indulging every desire that he wanted, having gone after the false gods and just enormously offending God, I believe the enemies that God sent Solomon from the north, from the south, I think they brought Solomon to his knees. And the book of Ecclesiastes is a record of that. You have to read it in context. And this is how he ends the book. Right before he, I believe right close to after he dies. Go to that last verse. I have it on the slides in Ecclesiastes. This is his conclusion to the book. He says, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is, in other words, I've talked about everything I did. I talked about all there is to have, all there is to enjoy. This phrase that he uses throughout Ecclesiastes, under the sun, in the human experience, during a human life, the conclusion is this. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Because this applies to every person. Now think about who's writing this, the king. He goes, it doesn't matter if you're lowly, it doesn't matter if you're all the way at the top, this matters for everyone. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good, whether it is evil. And I believe what Solomon is saying here is my evil acts and my sins were brought to light and they were exposed to me by God and my conclusion is that I have sinned therefore life is all about fearing God and keeping his commandments so no it's never too late to repent this side of eternity if you are on this side of the grave God graciously offers forgiveness to all who will repent of their sin, all who will forsake it, all who will reject it, all who beg for His mercy because of Christ, God forgives. God restores because of Christ, who from Solomon's vantage point was yet to come. But for us, He's the one who came true son of David, our true king, the Lord Jesus.
Father, you're a good God. You're kind and you're generous. You're patient. You're loving. Thank you for the truth that has been exposed to us in 1 Kings 11. Indeed, a tragic time, but yet, Lord, we see we see your grace. We see your mercy. Like Solomon, we deserve to be forsaken. We deserve to be judged. But you are a gracious God. You offer forgiveness, restoration to all who repent. And it's because of Jesus. As we remember him now at his table, his sacrifice on our behalf, may we do so in a way that brings honor and glory to him. Amen.